We have Ray Hyman with me here today, and you can learn what him and his team are up to by heading over to usaterra.com. And I'm going to make sure to have that link clickable in the show notes as we talk about multifamily investing. But uh, let's be honest, a little bit on the smaller side of things as as Ray, Ray and team focus on 20 units and, and below. It's kind of a neat little niche that you have there, Ray, and uh, one that I think is actually pretty underserved. So thanks for joining me here today. Of course. Happy to be on. Great show. Happy to be part of the content here. So let's start things off. You're a relatively young looking fella. Do you, How long have you been in this? Well, you know, it's really about my skincare routine more than anything <laughs> else. No, I'm kidding. So I, I've, been, I've been working in multifamily real estate for the last 10, 11 years or so always from the both property management side and the investing side, started in both pretty much right around the same time. Okay. So you've in that 10, 11 years, you've probably seen everything. I don't know if I've seen everything, but I've certainly seen quite a bit. I, we, we started off investing in New York City and have hmm. since moved to the Midwest. And those are sort of diametrically opposed markets in many ways. And so I, at least I think I've seen a broad spectrum of things, even if even I haven't seen everything. Every day you see something new though. That's the exciting part about that business. Well, I happen to be curious, what lessons did you learn in New York to push you Midwest? Yeah, I think there, there are a few things about New York that were great and moved our focus toward the Midwest. The two most important things are regulatory pressure. It's very difficult to operate a business when you have universal rent control, increased regulations around stabilization, so on and so forth, coming down the pike every single year in New York. It doesn't mean that you can't do a good job. And frankly, we did very well in the investments that we have done in New York, but it's a less scalable business. It's more difficult and the future is always uncertain. And frankly, the point of investing in real estate is to have a very stable, long-term growth asset that has meaningful cash flow and being in a place where that's at risk just defeats the purpose. You may as well invest in stock market. So that's one thing. The other thing is yields. Yields are very low in New York. There are many transactions that happen at a 4% cap rate and below even now. Whereas in the Midwest, we transact at a 9% cap rate and above. So from a cash flow perspective, from a returns perspective, it is just a significantly better market to operate in. There are many other things we like about the Midwest economically being over-indexed in healthcare and education, things like that. New York City has a lot of that stuff too. New York City is a great market in many other ways, but it's really those two things, regulatory pressure and yields, that it is just so much better to operate in the Midwest for what we focus on. Are there particular markets that you are focused in? Yeah. So we like a lot of different markets in the Midwest. The three that we're currently operating in are Columbus, Pittsburgh, and Indianapolis. We think that those markets represent the best or some of the best in the Midwest for being over, over-indexed in healthcare and education jobs, which is hugely important. It's recession-resilient fields, very well-paid. So you get great rent bumps, especially post-renovation. It's, there's a There's a massive supply shortage for housing in the Midwest, but there's a specific pinch in the sub luxury, but above tier B housing, especially in target neighborhoods in each city. So we're serving that particular part of the market. And they are also large enough for us to be able to invest at scale. They have a tremendous amount of sub 20 unit multifamily housing stock that hasn't been renovated in 15 years. So for us, it's just a sea of opportunities and a matter of you know how quickly can we operate to renovate our acquire and renovate our 20 units a month goal. So so how do you find most of your deals? Are they primarily off market? Are realtors bringing them to you? What, what does that look like? Yeah. The, the nice thing about the part of the market that we focus on is it's what we always say is too big for flippers, too small for developers. Kind of a tagline that basically means it's underserved. And the benefit there is that on-market deals are great. Off-market deals are, are even better, but you can buy from both. You can buy pocket listings, so on and so forth. You can pretty reliably hit your 9% average cap rate, especially with the way that we renovate, the way that we rent, the way that we manage, et cetera. And so for us, we're about 70% off-market today. It's an important part of our business, but the most important thing for off-market is that it allows us to do higher volume of transactions. Similar to how 
the this part of the market is underserved from from an investor perspective. It's also underserved from a broker perspective. So we actually have to go out and kind of do some of the brokering ourselves. But the deals that we do buy on market turn out to be also extremely attractive. So we can really do it through multiple channels. Well, I'd be curious then what you you focus on twenty units and less. You know, for these the smaller multifamily. Can I ask why you decided to have that focus? Yeah, so so we actually buy anything. We look at anything that's sub 100 units, and every year we buy a handful of deals that are you know 60, 80 units, something like that. But the way that we see it is, once you get below 100, you're sort of sub institutional, and that comes along with a lot of benefits. The seller base is less sophisticated and is more interested in selling on a very specific and short term horizon. They don't really have a hold and wait option. So they are frequently very motivated to sell. There are it's it's much more difficult to have local competitors going after the same properties. You might get local competitors going after house flipping or even duplexes, but once you get bigger than that, it's just too many dollars to put to work. And so we kind of live in this place that is, you know, not to overuse it, but underserved in a lot of different ways. When you go from 100 down to 50, that's significantly more meaningful. When you go down to 30 units, that's even more meaningful. But when you get to 20 units and below, and we buy everything from duplex up, it is incredibly more potent, the the lack of attention that that part of the market gets. We use some of the, you know, we think smarter techniques for off market, but it, we're not reinventing the wheel in a lot of ways. And we get in front of multiple sellers every single day that are interested in transacting at a price point that's going to make sense for our business model. That is not really possible if you're looking at 150 unit buildings. You won't even be able to get in touch with those sellers. And it's very difficult to do for single family homes because there's so much attention on single family home aggregation. So what we're really trying to do is take a multifamily approach and add a lot of the single family home aggregation technology and methodology to buy off market to buy with high frequency to renovate in scattered site manage scattered site with high frequency but in the more complicated higher barriers to entry more difficult to operate space of multifamily because it's not like single family home where one has more square footage than another but in general it's a pretty similar concept every time it's sometimes it's duplexes sometimes that are side by side duplexes sometimes it's a up and down duplex that was carved out of a single family home Sometimes it's a traditional, very brute looking eight unit apartment building. It really changes each time. There are certificates of occupancy. The renter base is extremely different from single family home renter base and is incredibly diverse both across markets and across sub markets. So it's a very, it's a much more complex Rubik's cube than the single family home aggregation. And so we're really trying to bring that strategy to something more complex with higher barriers to entry. And it's worked out well for us so far. It also has two things that are beneficial versus single family home aggregation. One is significantly less variation in average price per unit, whereas single family home is all over the place. You know, you look at the you look at the chart just from the early 2000s to now, you've got multiple ups and downs, crashes and spikes. And when you look at multifamily for that same period, especially for small multifam, I mean, it's it's just a steady incline over time. You look th- what happened to multifamily, especially in our markets through the financial crisis. It's, you know, it's just not really a very noticeable blip. And the other piece of it is that there is a level of complexity to it where you can't have Zillow come in and start buying four unit, five unit, six unit buildings. It's just too complex to have no human touch component. So we've found a nice place where where we can play and we don't feel like Amazon or Zillow or something like that is going to come in and blow up the market. But at the same time, our part of the our little slice of the multifamily world is getting more attention. And so there's more institutional capital coming into it. We benefit from that from an investor perspective, so on and so forth. So it's also kind of a nice inflection point for the small multifamily world. So I, I would imagine that you kind of took it as a slow go into into these individual markets. Could you talk a little bit about how you currently manage them, especially when you start from the beginning versus as you accumulate more? I would have to think the management process changes over time. Extremely. And 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 one thing that I would mention on on the management side of things is similar to what we're saying 
we talked about before, the difference between you know, single family homes and much larger multifamily properties. Single family homes, when you rent to somebody, it, it becomes, there's a sense of ownership. They pay all of the utilities, they cut the lawn. It's, you know, it's very different from managing a six unit property or 150 unit property. And then when you have a 150 unit property, you have a doorman, you have a porter, you have all that stuff. It's not scattered site. It's in a single location. So obviously that's very different from me managing 150 units of 10, 12, 18 unit properties. And so the, that is one of the things that there isn't great infrastructure for today and that we have to build internally. And it's one of the most difficult things about operating in small multifam. So it's a good thing to point out. I think the, the, the scattered site management for many smaller buildings is just very difficult. What we do is we have a very tech first approach to management. So we start off with an exclusively cloud-based property management system. We use Buildium. We add into that and layer all of the different Buildium that got bought by RealPage. So it has tons of different plugins to help with offshore phone lines, DIY repairs for residents, alternative options for security deposits, alternative options for move in, move out. And then we add on top of that some truly third party technology that helps us monitor each of these sites. One of them is called Nowi Sensors. It's a sensor that goes basically on the bottom of the water meter so that if there's a running water issue. If you have a 150 unit building, you know right away because it's a problem for 150 people. If it's going on at a four unit building where some people are on vacation and one person just isn't reporting, then you wouldn't know about it for potentially weeks. So we install things like that so that we know right away and it makes it much more similar to managing a large property. And then from a HR and, and human capital perspective, what we what we like to do is have a sort of handyman team that is you know, one handyman per 75 units. And then it mimics what it's like to live in a large scale residential building, which by the way, is a huge benefit to residents and residents really like that is that they feel like they have, they feel like they live in a large luxury building. They put in a ticket, the ticket gets handled right away. It's automated process. They don't have to call up some old landlord that might not answer the phone. You don't even know if he's still around or he's vacation in Florida. He's got a landline. This is a you know very streamlined tech first way of going about it. So that's really our key to management. Our other thing is that we're extremely focused on leasing. Our belief is that if you get the right resident in in the beginning, then ninety percent of your problems on the back end are solved. Somebody who's responsible, somebody who obviously meets the income qualifications and all that sort of thing, which we have very high qualifications on because we're really only in the most attractive sub markets in each city, and that is solves a lot of the difficulties that come along with scattered site. I think once you get into tier B, tier C submarkets and you have a renter base that's not as responsible, not as responsive, then the cracks really start to form and the issues with scattered site management become very clear. So that's really our focus on management. I think you you had asked about another piece of of scattered site that wasn't management. I'm sorry, I forgot what that was. No, I, do you actually have boots on the ground then? It sounds you said you're technology forward, but there's got to be there's got to be something there, right? Yeah, so we have we have boots on the ground in every single market. Our main person is our market specialist who actually is a vertically integrated analyst, it's somebody who's somewhere between the age of 22 and 26. And their focus is acquiring properties, going through the renovation process on, on properties, and also management. So there's a full responsibility for an individual so that they are not picking bad deals because they have to deal with the consequences down the line. And their compensation is oriented so that that fits as well. That is key for us. We also have the, the handymen that are boots on the ground folks. They are typically folks that have worked with us on apartment turns and renovations in the past. They are not full-time handymen. They are on call, though, 24-7 for any maintenance-related issue. And that system has worked out very well for us. We use the same system. and We actually took that system from New York, which is very commonly how brownstones and walk-ups are managed in New York. There's a lot of small multifamily in New York. A really high percentage of total multifamily housing is in walk-ups and brownstones. And that's the approach that managers have used there for... 100, 200 years. And so we've, we've taken that and brought it to the Midwest and it's, it's worked out really well for us. 
You mentioned tenants that are attracted and problems associated with B or C apartments or, or properties. So does that mean that you target A or properties that you can push into A? Yeah, we like to call it A minus. So what we are is really the small multifamily alternative that's a block or two blocks away from the large scale new development project. We buy properties that are sometimes rough. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're in good condition, but frequently they have one vacant unit or they need serious renovation. You couldn't really do an apartment turn and move somebody into it today. And we wouldn't want to do that because what we're trying to do is renovate up to very close to that luxury standard, still in a very cost-effective way, but white subway tile, not LVT flooring, one step above, washer dryer in unit, all stainless steel appliances, you know, you you name it, you got granite countertops, you name it, what would be in a luxury apartment building, but in a walk-up that is does not have a doorman, doesn't have central amenities, anything like that. And is a 30, 35 to 45 percent discount versus the luxury on rent. And so that's the part of the market that we're targeting. In the Midwest, it goes a long way for a couple of reasons. One, there's not a ton of luxury housing per capita. And two, there is a general I'm I'm from the Midwest, so I I can say things like this. There's a general thriftiness among Midwesterners. If they can save 30 to 40% on rent and still have something that's a very close product, that really resonates with them. And so we get tremendous amount of demand for our apartment buildings. We only want to be in the best locations. That's where this model works best. We really, if, if, you know, name a market that we're in, we'll, we'll say the five or six neighborhoods that we operate in. Those are the ones that anybody would recognize from there. They'd be, oh, German Village. Oh, that's really nice. Or, oh, Shadyside. Wow, that's a, my, my, my cousin lives there. It's so beautiful. I can't believe there's a neighborhood like that in Pittsburgh. It's, it's that sort of a thing. Sure. Just to remind everybody, if you want to learn more about Ray and his team, head over to usaterra.com. Again, that's going to be a clickable link in the show notes. And if you found some value in what we're talking about so far, do us a quick shaver, a quick favor and share it with one of your investor friends. So Ray, can you talk a little bit about the the rehab process then? Because you, you're, you mentioned kind of some things a bit like some things are probably very little rehab. Some are very heavy rehab. You got boots on the ground for, for management. What does the management process look like as it is a project at that point? Yeah, so the the same boots on the ground that are responsible for buying the property are also responsible for renovating it, and then they will be responsible for managing it after with the market specialist that, that is in each market. The renovation process, though, is a big differentiating factor for us because it's one thing to flip a single family home. It's very, very different thing to manage a multifamily a multifamily renovation. It's not a in and out standardized process. Each property is a you know, frequently the layout changes. There are requirements for certificate of occupancy. It's more common to have to pull permits, so on and so forth. So it's a very different and more complex thing. We're differentiated in a few ways. I think our management's differentiated. I think our off market acquisition strategy differentiated, but probably the most important thing is our ability to renovate. So we go into these properties. Sometimes there are existing residents. Sometimes there's not. We are extremely fair-handed with folks that are living in there. We give them, you know, not going to kick them out before the lease is over. Obviously, we give them a tremendous amount of notice. We give them the option to move back into the property after it's renovated, so on and so forth. But eventually, what we want to get is a vacant building. And once we have that, then we launch our renovation process. We do a very specific 105-day schedule to complete a renovation, and it's all the things that. I mentioned granite countertops, white subway tiles, stainless steel appliances, really nice modern flooring, in addition to adjusting any structural work that needs to be done, which is very frequent, especially for pre-war and immediately post-war buildings. There is sometimes things like asbestos abatement that is required. It's less common in single family homes because you know exactly when it's built and what materials are used. It's more of an issue for properties that have been around for longer and might have been renovated at one point in time or another. So you have to go find it. And the way that we manage that is through a software that is not 
homegrown, but one that we've customized significantly so that there's a Gantt chart for every single part of every single project. It allows us to step back and look at the 80, 90, 100 renovation projects that we have going on and be able to pick out, oh, that one's behind schedule for this reason. We need to make these adjustments. It allows us to to put in construction groups that will that will test out on a given project, see if they're ready for more work, and then remove them if they're not and replace them with something else. So it, it kind of takes what is a nebulous, difficult project. And anybody who's done a home renovation project or flipped a house or done something like that knows how difficult it can be. And you're getting phone calls that, oh, they didn't think about the timing for countertops are four weeks out and we finished everything else, but now we have to drop everybody off the project for four weeks. So we wait for that last piece. We've done enough of these, seen enough of these and made it very process oriented to the point where nobody's immune to delays and issues that totally happens to us. And it's very annoying and we have to work around it, but we have minimized the risk of that in so many different ways. And as a result have really, really cut down on costs. So if we're doing a very serious renovation of a unit, we might be putting $35,000 per door, but we can turn a, a property that's in medium shape that doesn't require a ton of structural improvements or anything that has to do with the bones or piping or anything like that. We can turn those units into very near luxury, including getting rid of popcorn ceilings and replacing with flat wall sheetrock for anywhere from fifteen dollars to $18,000 per door, which is very attractive for one basic reason is that we're typically buying these properties from anywhere from seventy dollars to $90,000 per door. Once we're done with renovations, we're typically in at the one hundred twenty dollars to $140,000 per door. The market rate for selling uh, just the, our average unit size is closer to one hundred eighty dollars to $200,000 per door. And then part of what differentiates us is that we invest out of a fund. And so what we do is create large portfolios. We take advantage of portfolio arbitrage. We sell to larger, more institutional buyers. And so they actually pay a portfolio premium. They pay more per door than an individual asset buyer would. That's part of the benefit of being able to sell 200 units to XYZ investment fund instead of four units to Tim and Jake from down the streets, their first multifamily investment. And so when we do that, it's closer to 200 to $225,000 per door at exit. And even with that, it's a you know thirty-five to forty percent discount versus where large-scale multifam trades. So it, it, there's a, a significant bump for investors that come in there as well. So for us, being able to renovate tightly, efficiently, and on time allows us to hit those numbers, and that's really where our our returns are generated: buying well and renovating well. That's what does it for us. We add a good amount of value and we reap tremendous amount of value from creating a very good multifamily product in an underserved part of an underserved market. So that's that's really the focus of what we do. And I would say that the key is working very closely with contractors for the first few times, building a really good relationship and trust with them over time. If they're not doing well, get rid of them immediately. Don't waste a single week. And if they are doing well, start to give them more rope until they have really developed into the contractor that you need and who's going to stay with you for 5, 10, 15 years. You've, you've probably heard the phrase, you don't want to be the most expensive house on the block. But what you're talking about too, do you have any restrictions regarding making this just under the luxury apartments? Like, are you... Are you rehabbing these things up to being the most expensive apartments on the block? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. In each of the markets where we play, we're not the only people that do this. So that's important to us. Doing the whole, if you build it, they will come thing is interesting. And sometimes it works super well, but other times it does not work well at all. And so what we want to have is a really proven market that we're going into. We want to come in and do it bigger with more scale and better than the current people that are doing it. But we want to make sure that there's an existing market for those products. The best house on the block thing that is nice about what we do is that we never underwrite within 35% of luxury rents. So no matter what, there's always a luxury building down the block. It is always, if you're at two thirds of luxury, then it's always 50% more expensive to move from our product to luxury. So we're always staying below that bound. 
yes, we rent higher than that. Yes, that helps us get above 9% cap rate. But from an underwriting perspective, we want to stay below that. So we have that nice, nicer house down the block always when we're investing. And that's luxury. That's luxury multifam. That said, you know, some, some of our competitors are doing similar things nearby. That's true. Yes, we have more scale than most of those groups. So versus the worst house in the block, we're certainly better than that. But the worst house in the block is the one we're buying and we're turning it into the second best house in the block. Sure. You mentioned 70% of these properties are off market. And uh, I almost would define some of those since you're talking about smaller multifamilies is, is frustrated landlords, that type of thing. So what are some of the common pain points you're running into or the things that you have to deal with and clean up after the fact? Yeah, th- that, that list is, is almost endless, but it's not endless. And we've figured it out to a science and we're able to pretty much ad- identify them within five days of signing a contract and, and be able to put it in the budget for, for, for handling them. But the, a couple of numbers about small multifam that are, that are interesting. So 80% of multifamily units in the United States are small multifam, which is shocking. The first time I, I heard that number, I was very surprised. There, there is a lot of US multifamily housing stock that is in smaller properties. In the markets that we operate, it's a lot higher number. There isn't as much per capita multifamily development because obviously going into that average of New York City, San Francisco, LA, Houston, Dallas, et cetera, Miami, but 80% is that way. 7% of small multifamily is owned by individual investors versus, or sorry, 7% of multifamily is owned by institutional investors versus more like 45% for institutional grade plus 50 unit multifamily. So the vast majority of owners in small multifamily own one or two properties. The average number of units that a small multifamily owner owns is 10. And so if you can imagine yourself, you have a day job, you might be a lawyer or who knows, you might have inherited the property, but you don't have time to manage two properties across 10 units across two properties. It is extremely difficult. I would say that the realistic number is maybe you could you could operate one duplex or one quad as a second job but not as your as you know anything more than that is very difficult and so the 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 piece of the small multifamily market that's so interesting to us is that these landlords are extremely frustrated they don't have time to take care of it they are frequently thought it was going to be kind of their retirement to do but it's too much work for them they are too old to be running it or they're young and they inherited it and they don't know what to do with it because they don't know anything real about real estate. And frequently, surprisingly enough, they forgot that they owned this asset. That is probably 20 to 30% of the inbounds that we get from our off-market outreach is, oh man, I forgot about that. Or I, I, I'm pretty sure, yeah, that, that, that building is doing fine. It's, it's, it's leased up. And then we go in and take a look and, and two of the three units are vacant, right? So like that, that's a pretty common story for us. We have everything you can imagine from structural work that that needed to be done 30 years that hasn't been addressed and now requires a serious fix. We have a pipe that burst two years ago and has significant water damage. We have you know four units across two buildings on the same plot, one of which was in a massive that had a massive fire at, two years ago and nobody did anything. All kinds of issues like that, and so we step in the price changes based on the level of complexity we're, you're not we're obviously not going we're going to demand a higher cap rate for something that is really difficult for us to do but we will address virtually all of those issues there are some structural things that are beyond repair that we won't touch with a 10 foot pole every market has their specifics there are areas of pittsburgh for instance that are on red silt beds that you don't want to be on because they are moving over time and there's no amount of structural work that can solve that problem for you. So we do not buy properties in those zones. But for the most part, we will come in there and handle it. And it is something that those sellers don't necessarily want to have out in the market. They don't want to air their dirty laundry. They don't, they're not competent enough or or desirous of having to go through the process of working with a broker and coordinating show times. They don't want to put more money into it, which brokers will always require you to do before a sale. And so they're very happy to work directly with a buyer who's going to do all the coordinating and accessing themselves. It's just one party. And after 30 days, they can forget about the 
property and don't have to worry about it ever again. And they walk away with a great check that in many cases is completely unexpected. So that is really the type of thing we walk into. We don't see a lot of squatters, surprisingly. That's partly because of the neighborhoods that we've picked. If there is a squatter, somebody will complain, the police come, et cetera. And we don't see a lot of vagrancy in in front of the properties. That's also partly because of the the neighborhoods that we've chosen. So some of the things you might be, you know, horror stories from LA or San Francisco or something like that, we don't have those, but pretty much everything under, else under the sun, we get, you know, every single time. Sure. You know, based on what you're describing here, you know, you mentioned, I think you used the term scattered investing. I would imagine that you rely very heavily, you mentioned processes, but also documentation associated with your workflows, how things should be handled, maybe even a inventory list of, of what you expect each unit to look like. Could you talk a little bit about how you maintain that type of thing? What's it, what are your expectations on that? Yeah, so we have checklists from everything that is before we put a property under contract, before we fin- finish the due diligence period, before we close, before construction starts, once construction is completed, so on and so forth. And we're just religious about those due diligence task lists. I think when you are a new employee with us, you're like, holy gosh, there are a lot of rows in this Excel sheet. But then once you see the real life, you know, what happens when you don't make sure that all that stuff is followed to a T, then you quickly realize the value of making sure that you cross every T and dot every, but every I for each project. And that's really, that's really our bread and butter is we add to that list. Every time we see something new, it goes on there. We borrow. And every time we talk to another operator, we add to that list from something that they've seen or heard about. Every market has their own unique specific things that need to go on there. And we're just extremely organized. We don't spend a tremendous amount of time reviewing those because we do it in concentrated due diligence meetings and pre-close meetings and and pre-construction closeout meetings. So my time and the time for our managers is not spent 100% doing that. It's very efficient, but it's also exhaustive. And so we do not miss things off those lists. That's really the key. Doing that real time for management is much more difficult. And we do our best to do that with quarterly reviews of properties. And we rely heavily on pictures and matching them versus prior pictures. We've started to actually use AI for some of that to see where things are out of whack. But that we, we rely heavily on residents to report issues as they come up, as you know most landlords do. And it goes back to the thing about your residents, right? Is that if you pick somebody that's really good, really responsible, really responsive, as soon as there's an issue with the property, they're going to report it. They're going to report it timely, and then we can handle it. And it's our responsibility to live up to their expectations of getting work done quickly and not leaving things out of whack for long. And there's a symbiosis there between landlord and resident that's super important to us. So we are, they are our customers. They're also our partners. They are also our residents. They're also our tenants. And so it's a, it's a complex but important relationship. And I think there are a lot of ways to make it a good one and a lot of ways to make it a bad one. We, we do our best to make it a, a very good relationship. Well, talking about partners, I would imagine you're, are you, do you seek capital or how do you acquire these properties? Yeah, so we we actually for anything is above twenty units, we just do a typical syndication process. Eventually, we might do a fund for that, but it's been simpler to just do it in syndications. Frequently, it's a single LP that we have that will write an entire an entire check. What we do for our twenty units and below, which is our primary focus, is we invest out of a committed capital fund. That fund is devoted to those markets and that property size and those sub markets and that level of return threshold, and we raise from a number of different groups. It includes large scale fund of funds, some institutional and quasi institutional investors, many family offices, predominantly single family offices. We're, we're a little small for the larger multifamily offices, but the single family offices, we have a, a good number of those. And then we have high net worth individuals and accredited individuals that make up the long tail of that, of that investment fund as well. 
And as long as, you know, similar to the, to the resident conversation, if you're going to be a good long-term capital partner with us, then we welcome you on board and would love to have you and want to show you what you can do investing with Terra in the long run. And that is, you know, something that we, we add to that long list of people every single week. And so that's been a, a great source of capital for us as well. But it's really a mix between super professional and buttoned up institutional shops that invest with us on a secondary basis and then groups and, and, and individuals that, that invest with us in the long tail and everything in between. So it's been, it's been great partnering with those folks and everyone that's been with us, save one or two folks that just kind of sort of retired everyone that's been with us 10 years ago is is still with us today. So it's been, it's been nice to see that give them multiple exits so they can see the value of it and allow them to take bigger and bigger pieces of each fund. As we go, we raise a new fund every 18 to 24 months or so. Well, this has been a a very interesting conversation and, and I'm going to point everybody to your website one more time, head over to usaterra.com. But Ray, before I let you go, I have some rapid fire questions to end the show with. Excellent. Can you give me a lie real estate investors tell themselves and sometimes to others? Yes. I mentioned it a little bit before, but that if you build it, they will come concept is incredibly common, especially for syndicators. And by that, I mean, they see a a deal opportunistically. It looks like a good price per unit. So they go after it, but they don't think about the fact that it's not on the right side of this employer or that employer. It's too long of a drive time versus other competitors, blah, blah, blah. For every investment, especially in real estate, there's a a good, smart story that makes sense and causes it to be a good deal. And then there is also, for all bad investments in real estate, there is a bad story that doesn't make sense, that is logically not good and will cause it to be a bad deal. And the nice thing about real estate is it's all testable. So you can take a look at comps. You can see what other people have rented for. You can take a look at where population is going. You can look at what employers are going to be nearby and have a good narrative around why that makes sense to invest in that asset in that location. And you should do that. You should get the right story. You should test it. And if it doesn't pan out, you should bail immediately. And there's no shame in in bailing on something that turns out to be a bad deal. But it's not true that simply having multifamily housing in a city that you like is a good investment. It is significantly more complex than that. And you have to do more work to confirm that. Otherwise you're just really rolling the dice. Do you have a book recommendation or what are you reading right now? Yeah, I have a good book recommendation. I recommend a lot. I am on a tear of reading about world historical individuals, generals, leaders, et cetera. I finished one. It's actually been a while, but I think it's one of the most, it's one of the ones that I recommend the most, which is Chernow's Washington about George Washington. I think it's a must read to understand that time period and one of the most important people in America, but also he's an incredibly inspiring person, but not for a lot of the reasons that you think from having read your history textbook in middle school. So he's a great one to learn more about. Would highly recommend that book too. It's very well written. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? I think the number one thing would be to not be so worried about where you are right now. Long before going, you know, full time with Terra Capital, I was working in investment banking, JP Morgan. I did management consulting at Booz Co. I worked for a private equity fund in Boston called Sparica. So I've I've been in all these different places and kind of thinking, oh, is this is this where I'm going to be forever? Should I stay here forever? So on and so forth. But I think especially when you're in your 20s, which you know, frankly, has been a little while. But when you're when you're in that age, is to or or when you're starting to think about transitioning into another career path, be patient for the opportunity, but take it when you see it, and don't be so concerned with what you're doing right now. Most people's second, third, fourth jobs are not what they do for the most of their life. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's totally fine to leave a job and start a new career path. And hey, if things don't work out, it's totally fine to go back. There's no shame in that. What single strategy, process, or tool have you implemented that has had a direct time-saving impact on your business? I think 
the number one thing that we have done is similar to a management consulting firm, taking taking a step back and and really defining all the different parts of a process and thinking about what the bottlenecks are and the issues and the things that we're good at and the things that we're bad at and trying to fill those gaps in. But more tactically, obviously in the last six to nine, maybe even 12 months, we've been able to fill a lot of those gaps with AI. And that's been good. I think another great one though has been what people might call VAs. I don't usually think of them that way. I usually think of them more in terms of offshore resources for things, but everything from bookkeeping to how we do our leasing. So there's 24 hour response time on inbounds, so on and so forth. It's just a whole world of offshore resources for you that work for companies that do this specifically day in and day out and will always do it better than you. There is no way for you to create a program that is better than them unless it's all you do. So you can't do real estate investing and make a good leasing service. You have to rely on the third party. So that that is, is in, in my opinion, one of the most important things. If you can't handle management, you should hire a property manager. There's no problem with doing that. Everyone has a property manager. We self-manage, but most groups do not. And it's totally fine to rely on third parties for as much as you can if you're not good at it. Well, it's kind of interesting you say that they will always do it better than you. As entrepreneurs, I think we have we struggle with that concept and we believe that nobody does it better than us. And it's hard to let some of those things go. As a leader in your organization, have you found that to be difficult? I think it is super humbling, but the most important thing you can do is look at something that you're trying to do and realize, oh, I stink at this. I mean, I am bad and it is affecting the rest of my business and I can't keep going by doing this myself. I'm wasting a ton of time on it. It's not getting done well. At the high level, it, I think having a business partner is fantastic, especially if it's somebody that compliments you really well. I have a business partner, Tom Higgins. He's the other 50-50 owner of Terra Capital. He is an amazing resource and is incredibly talented, especially in the development construction management side of our business. He used to work at Lennar Multifam and just has crazy credentials for that. And he's been incredibly helpful on that front, bringing in employees that can do things or are willing to work really hard and burn the midnight oil to find deals and figure out ways to make deals work is something that I can't do. So having them in there and I am not an accountant. I am not a digital designer. I'm not a website maker. I just, I am bad at that stuff. I'm good at other things. Sometimes maybe some people think so, but for the most part, I'm not good at a lot of very specific things. So filling those gaps in, as quickly as possible. And sometimes you have to pay for it. Sometimes you have to pay more money than you want to. It's it's worth it. It's the only way to build a 21st century business that works well, especially if you have fewer than 10 employees, which we do. It's just, it's unrealistic to think that you can compete with larger, you know, Google can in-house a lot of these processes because they can effectively create a separate company that does accounting for them in, internally we can't do that, right? So it, it, it relying on other groups, they will be better than you. And yes, you have to police them and make sure it's going well and fire them if it's not going well. But there is a solution out there that's that's much better than doing it yourself. There's no doubting it. Sure. Well, Ray, this has been a great conversation. Is there a question or topic you wish we would have covered here today? No, I think that's it. I think I just thinking back on the conversation, it's great conversation, excellent question is helpful to think about. And I think one of the things that we did talk a lot about is thinking about third parties and other people to to do things well that is not in your wheelhouse. I would extend that to property management, which I talked about a little bit, but that, that's something that if, if it's not your specialty, don't try to make it your specialty. It's hard. And the second thing is investing in real estate, investing in anything really. It's going on and being a day trader of stocks when you're not a stockbroker or a Wall Street insider is not a great idea. It is also the same thing is true for multifamily real estate investing. If you are, if you have a deal that you're super excited about or you want to build a company, by all means, go for it. But just doing a few things here and there also can be super fun. Totally encourage it. But if you're going to if you're going to put a large amount of money towards it, I would recommend putting 
a decent amount of that cash towards third-party managers, third-party investment managers like Terra. And there are many other groups that do it in every other part of the country for commercial, residential, industrial, large, small, whatever you want. If you believe in that, invest at least a good share of the money you want to devote towards real estate with somebody who's a, a professional. It will have a, a better outcome for you. There's a lot of variation deal to deal. There's less variation if you hedge your risk with a manager. One last time, usaterra.com. It's been great meeting you, Ray, and hope you'll come back again sometime. Likewise. Thank you for having me.